This is FRM Part 2, Book 3, Operational Risk and Resiliency, and the chapter on management of risks associated with money laundering and the financing of terrorism. This is another short chapter, and it's written by a gentleman by the name of Mark Carey, who is part of the Global Association of Risk Professionals. In fact, he is the co-president of the GARP Risk Institute. Um, he has been part of the Federal Reserve Board working on financial stability, which is uh, a good topic, uh, at least for today's chapter and previous chapters as well. He's also editor or co-editor of several well-respected academic journals. Uh, but for my liking, uh, the coolest thing about this gentleman is that he has a PhD in economics uh, from Berkeley. And so all of the examples that I have given you in terms of marginal costs and marginal revenues and all the old, all the old economic stuff, uh, he's, he's well versed in. So I, I tell you this not to convince you that this is a more important article than others, because each of these chapters is critical for your success, but uh, but uh, this particular guy seems to be especially talented. Um, look at this, great news for you. One learning objective, but notice that in uh, highlight bold, assessment, management, mitigation, and monitoring of money laundering and financial terrorism. So it sounds to me like uh, those are four really, really good questions on an exam. Let's start with the obvious first question, what is money laundering? And I bet you don't need uh, any kind of a textbook definition of this. Those of you who watch movies like I do know that money laundering uh, shows up in lots and lots of movies and some of our favorite ones that are out there. Of course, I'll point to that great James Bond movie, Casino Royale, in which uh, the bad guy in the movie, I think his name is Le Chief, he takes some money from questionable sources and goes and buys a hundred million dollars worth of worth of put options on an airline. And his plan is to blow up the introduction of this new jet liner and uh, then the stock price is going to fall. Of course, James Bond um, figures it out and uh, prevents the bomb from going off and cleverly uh, kills the guy who was hired to blow up the plane. And so this uh, this guy, Le Chief, loses $100 million because his put options expired worthless. And so somehow, somehow that money went from these questionable sources into the financial system. And so that sounds an awful lot like money laundering to me. But notice what, what we have in, in bolded words. Uh, illegal process of converting funds into some untainted form that requires complex sequence of banking transfers. Now, of course, in the James Bond movie and in most movies, they skip over that part um, regarding the complexity of those banking transfers. But what has to happen, and that really can only be one of two scenarios, is that you have somebody who is uh, complicit in the money laundering inside of the bank, or more likely that there is a system that, can, that has gaps or holes in it that can be taken advantage of by wise uh, money launderers. Look at that second block point there, exposes the bank to reputational damage, of course, fines, restrictions, and, and of course, to limit their ability to maintain their core operations. And so if you look, you know, the ability to do their business, you know, when I think of that, I always think of the ability to generate cash flows. This is what we learned back in 1958 from Medigliani and Miller, that the value of any firm is its ability to generate sustainable and growth cash flows. Um, go ahead and look at the chronology that we've listed down here at the bottom in this illustration. Uh, notice there are three steps here, placement into the system and then layering. So there's the complexity of using offshore accounts, maybe some derivative securities markets because those markets tend, tend to be less regulated and then uh, integration back into, uh, into 
uh, the regular kind of consumer behavior. So what do we have over there? Integration, commercial, industrial investments, purchase of luxury assets there. Notice that there's a watch and an airplane. Uh, I'm pretty sure those don't cost the same amount, but nevertheless, and so the purchase of these luxury assets through the banking system, and we'll go ahead and talk about that in just a little bit, but how about some examples of these high profile cases? So you have HSBC and Wachovia both um, were fined um, substantial amounts for money, money laundering, either that had to do with uh, uh, drug cartels or uh, terrorist financing. How about the part of that learning objective in which we examine essential elements of sound money laundering and financial terrorism risk management? All right, so this adds to our toolbox of risk management. <clears throat> you know, we're in the process of identifying and quantifying and managing <clears throat> all of these risks. So now we have this ML and FT to add to our business risk, to our third party risk, to credit risk, to all those risks that we've talked about in the past. <clears throat> now, as you know, I like to go back to those business lines. Remember, we originally called those the silos in, inside of a financial institution. And so the assessment of money laundering and financial terrorism has to uh, encompass all of those business lines. So that first block point sweep across all levels and all business lines. And of course, this really begins with uh, due diligence performed on the clients and the customers. You know, I've used examples uh, of me personally walking into your financial institution and asking for a loan or saying I need some kind of asset management services. And, and you as a good financial risk manager are going to look at me and say, OK, Jim, you know, credit risk. Right. Um, and. Uh, systematic risk, et cetera, et cetera. But adding to that now is your kind of evaluation of, hey, do I have an identification that tells me that I live, uh, you know, in this particular state and am I who I am? I say that I am. Of course, I love going back to the Jason Bourne movies as well. Do you remember at the end of that Jason Bourne movie, the first one, he, he, uh, he finds the girl that uh, helped him and he wants to rent one of her motor scooters and she says, do you have ID? And he says, you know, not really. Now, of course, that's just the end of a movie and we're supposed to cry and uh, because they're back together again. But I mean, here's the, the question and the simple question. Do you, do you have an identification and can you prove who you are? Notice that third block point. I have uh, red, bold, clear policies. All right. So we have clear policies on evaluating uh, credit risk. We have clear policies on evaluating third party risk. We spent lots of time on those things. So now we have to have clear policies for managing money laundering and financial terrorism risk as well. Now, you shouldn't be surprised at all that there is a section on the slide deck and that Mark uh, wrote about in this chapter about the board, right? So the board should, and you don't even need me to read these to you, right? The board should what do we know? The board should know everything there is to know about everything that relates to the financial institution. So clear understanding of risk. Remember, board members don't have to be experts on credit risk or third party risk or financial terrorism risk, but but they have to be talented enough and skilled enough to be able to understand those risks if they're presented to them in a, a simple manner. Right regularly be furnished, right? Delegate roles and responsibilities and accountability. So we like, we like all those things. All right, there's, here's a really good exam question in this uh, three lines of defense against ML and FT. All right, so business units should lead. So remember, we've got this chief risk officer over here in the umbrella, and then we have these business unit managers. So they business unit managers, they need to lead uh, in identifying and controlling for these extra risks. And then there should be a chief officer in charge of anti-money laundering and financial terrorism. All right. So you have one really smart individual who has experience in both of these areas. 
continuous monitoring and face the operations and interacting with all internal and external authorities. And remember in a previous chapter, we talked about outsourcing as well. So here's one of those gaps that I was talking about earlier. Is there, uh, is there an outsource risk that leads into our system so that money, money laundering or uh, support of uh, terrorism financial is possible. So not only do you have to have some internal controls, um, going back to our previous chapter on outsourcing, there, there has to be this policy of making certain that our outsourced or our subcontracting activities also meet the standards and the policies outlined inside of the business. And so that leads right into the third part there, um, internal audit. So independent assessment, enforced policies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right, how about risk assessment? So where are we? We're identifying the risks, we're quantifying the risks, then we're manage the, managing the risks. So somewhere in the quantifying the risks, we're going to assess them. So look at these. Here's a great multiple choice question. You know, look at those. Uh, those circle points on the far right, you could have a question stem that says something like, you know, here, here's, a, here's a scenario that does this and this and this. Is this part of the risk assessment of activity or documentation or country analysis? So that's a really good, uh, that's a really good exam question. So risk assessment has these three components, activity, documentation, and country analysis. And then there are some particular identifications or particular markets uh, markers that are unique to each one of those of those risk possibilities. Customer due diligence and acceptance, right? <laughs> Written policies and procedures that bar customer acceptance until their identity is satisfactory, satisfactorily established. Occupation, source of income, all, right, all that good stuff. Um, of course, Jason Bourne had none of those things to rent out a scooter, but then that wasn't really a financial institution. But if Jason Bourne came in to uh, our financial institution and said, you know, I want to borrow money to open up my own scooter business with my girlfriend, well, then then I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. Let's just scratch our heads and enjoy uh, Matt Damon in those awesome movies. Uh, boy, look at the circle point. In some cases, banks may rely on third parties for lots of different things, but also for customer diligence. All right, so this goes to this KYC, the Know Your Customer Process. And I really like this illustration because, you know, look at the left block over there. So we have some ID program. And then, and then we get into what is it that this client is particularly interested in with our financial institution. So we do a wealth analysis, sanctions and screening, and then risk scoring. And then of course, if all those are low, we say, hey, welcome aboard. Uh, how else can we help you? Here's our wealth management uh, and, or here's our loan officer, you know, have a nice day, right? Welcome, welcome to our family of clients. But if this risk is high, then, then we need to do this enhanced due diligence. You know, this was the different layers that we talked about in one of those earlier slides. Now, of course, we need to worry about what happens both inside of our geographic boundaries and, and outside. So we need to make certain that we have legal counsel that knows what the rules are here and knows what the rules are over there and what the commonalities are between and among all those rules and and regulations, but also what also what are the non commonalities and what are the potential uh, opportunities to swing into our financial uh, organization so that we could have some possibility of money laundering or financing financial terrorism. Right. Notice in bold there, I do have banks compliance department. Uh, correspondent banking, I mean, this is important. When doing business with other banks, you should not relax its own standards, right? Don't assume that that bank across the street or across the state or the province or across countries has the same standards that we do. Remember, now, what we're learning here is that we're learning some of these tremendous 
and helpful and effective risk management principles. And so we know we're doing all the right stuff inside of our financial institution. Let's not make the mistake of assuming that everybody out there is on our same team. And then, of course, uh, wire transfers. You know, these days like, you can wire your children money, you know, a variety of different ways. Note that there's some law out there that I'm not aware of that prevents children from wiring their parents' money. I don't think that's ever happened in our family. Uh, my smart son says that somehow uh, he can't do it. Anyway, so make sure wire transfers and the policies for wire transfers apply just like all the other things that that we've been talking about. And there I promised you the shortest video and there it was. So let me just remind you best practices. We've talked about that in many chapters. So be prepared for assessment, management, mitigation, and monitoring.